A 20-hour flight from Singapore to O'Hare International with a layover in Taipei was barely better than economy class, even for my birthday. I wasn't worried about returning to Chicago for a difficult meeting with our international stocks head and shares trading desk. What worried me was thinking about what awaited me at home. We arrived shortly after 8.30 a.m., and I caught a shuttle to the nearby Chicago Sheraton Suites Hotel. I had booked the room the night before, so it was ready for immediate check-in. After dropping my belongings, I showered and went to the gym. I worked out for an hour before taking a long, hot shower and a cold rinse to fully wake up. Despite the chilly April weather in Chicago, I braved the cold until my teeth chattered before warming up with hot water. Feeling refreshed, I went to the restaurant for an American breakfast I hadn't had in months. After eating pancakes, scrambled eggs, bacon and sausage drenched in maple syrup, and four cups of coffee, I headed to JP for my 10.30 appointment. Morgan on Dearborn Avenue. I took the elevator to the eighth floor, showed my identification, and was led to a small conference room. They kept me waiting for more than 17 minutes, and I didn't move a muscle. For my trips to Asia, I learned not to show fear or weakness. Joe Rutledge, VP of International Stock and Commodities Traders, and Samuel Young, our corporate lawyer, eventually entered their presence, indicating that someone was being fired. And it was I, Adam. Joe began without a handshake and motioned for me to sit. The confrontation started. What transpired in Singapore? Joe demanded. We sent you to calm things down and you approved a $300 million purchase of new company stock without any solid evidence. Yes. Yes to what? Yes. His face flushed. Explain. It is in my report. With over 200 years of combined experience, the CEO and management team are exceptional. Deloitte and KPMG have confirmed the project, which has been planned for 50 years. The aquaculture project is technologically advanced and has significant potential. Then why is their stock price declining? Yes, it went public at $17 per share and it is now $9.55. Did you buy more? Yes, because it will rebound once it reaches $25. Joe, you will profit significantly. We own 25% of the shares, making us the largest shareholder in a failing company, he responded. Because competitors are short-selling or buying the company at a low price, we must hold our ground. It is a failure, he stated. We must trade with confidence and maintain a positive risk ratio. It is all in my report, I reiterated. Your report is wishful thinking, he stated. The council has approved my recommendation. You are out. Samuel offered me three months' salary plus nearly 30 days of accrued vacation for a total of almost five months' pay. They also cashed in my stock options, bringing my total payout to nearly $800,000, but leaving me with a tarnished reputation and limited job opportunities. By 2 a.m., I had signed all of the forms, transferred my 401k to an IRA, returned all company materials, and was let out, standing on the sidewalk, holding an empty satchel. I felt like I was going to collapse. I hurried to catch a cab back to the hotel. I mixed whiskey with seven up in my room, imagining strangers watching me die on the street, which was just the sacrilege I needed. I sat down to think. At 42, I was too young to retire, but unsure whether I could start over. I decided that I needed courage. I purchased a new laptop, installed the necessary software, and started working. I transferred $50,000 from savings, and liquidated some investments in preparation for a $1,200,000 deposit into an offshore trading account called Blue Sky International. By 9 a.m., I had ordered a burger and a beer from room service. My phone had been off for 36 hours. Exhausted, I decided to rest, watch the news, and avoid dealing with everything. Jet lag eventually took its toll, and I fell asleep. The next morning, I ate an early breakfast and turned on my phone. It was flooded with messages. Help, Dad. Mom is having a breakdown due to Dean and Katie. What is going on with Gene? For my father. Birthday greetings from Gene's parents, my children, and Team Singapore. But nothing from Gene. It felt as if I did not exist. I took the 830 flight to Springfield and arrived home to chaos. The living room was disorganized, with games, soda cans, and plates everywhere. The kitchen sink was clogged, and the dishwasher and trash can were overflowing. The laundry room was piled high with dirty clothes. 
After three hours of cleaning and organizing, I noticed two empty wine bottles with different lipstick marks in the living room. Our bedroom required fresh sheets and ventilation. The children's rooms were dirty, but slightly better. Finally, I went to my office to check on Southeast Asia's aquaculture stock. It had dropped to $9.37, nearly two points lower for the day. It was time to see if I had the courage to enter the market. I called my father. My mother died five years ago from bosom cancer. We spoke about Jean. He said she appeared sad and depressed recently. She was heartbroken for no obvious reason. I checked our bank transactions and home phone messages and discovered nothing unusual. After folding the clothes, I looked for dinner options and found few. I reconnected the battery to my Audi A6, started it, and went to the supermarket to get groceries for Thai green curry and jasmine rice. I boiled rice with water, coconut milk, and ginger for flavor. I stir-fried chicken strips with zucchini, Asian eggplant, lemongrass, garlic, Asian basil, and cilantro. I added coconut milk, green curry paste, lime zest and juice, fish sauce, and a little sugar. I garnished the dish with spring onions, coriander, and basil leaves. Set the table and pour the beer. When Jean arrived, the kids ran inside, thrilled to see me. I hugged and kissed them, expressing how much I missed them. Katie cried in my arms, and Dean, who was more reserved, hugged me as well. Jean gave us a wistful look and kissed me gently. Welcome home, Adam, she said without enthusiasm. That smells good. What is it? Thai green curry, I replied. Dean and Katie were curious. It smells really good. Dean said this while hugging me again. Go clean up before dinner. Jean instructed. Later, she hugged and kissed me. You appear exhausted, Adam. Why are you returning so soon? I was fired, I admitted. She blushed and stumbled for words. We will figure something out. But how about you? She appeared distant, more of an acquaintance than my wife. Are you okay? It's work, she said, attempting to smile. The market is down, and there's a lot of pressure on me. She gestured to demonstrate the extent of the pressure. The kids returned and we gathered for dinner. I served the meal and poured wine for Jean. Dean and I drank Mountain Dew while Kathy drank water. We dined together for the first time in four months. I told stories about Singapore and organized team-building activities such as dragon boat races and combat archery. Dean and Kathy surprised me with a wonderful present after dinner. Happy birthday, Dad, they said, bringing tears to Jean's eyes. I kissed my children as Jean said, Oh my God, Adam, I'm so sorry. I completely forgot. I resisted, reminding her of her gold diamond earrings. I got her for her birthday and concentrated on the kids. I opened my present. Brothers in Arms said I adored that show and had always wanted the CD collection. I kissed the children again. Our smiles reflect the joy of giving and receiving. Jean was embarrassed and regretful, promised to bring me a gift the next day. You don't have to. I explained. Being at home with my family is all I need. Dean and Katie hugged me again, saying, Love you, Daddy. We talked at the table for more than an hour, but the kids needed to do their homework while Jean and I cleaned up the kitchen. What's happening, Jean? You are not yourself. She hesitated before admitting, I don't know, Adam. I am depressed. You've always traveled extensively, and the last trip was too long. We had hardly lived the same life. Tears ran down her cheeks. I'm feeling lost. I hugged her, and after some resistance, she allowed me to hold her while she sobbed quietly. She was correct. My job had kept me away for several years. We had agreed to make sacrifices in order to retire early, but they were beginning to take their toll. Jean suggested I spend time with the children. I helped Katie with her homework, then Dean, and finally tucked Katie into bed. Dean confided. Mom is not well, Dad. She's crying and not doing much in the house. I believe she's having a nervous breakdown. There were tears in his eyes. Please fix it, Dad. I nodded, but had no idea what to do. As I walked down the stairs, I overheard Jean on the phone. She abruptly ended the call when she saw me. Who was that? I asked one of the office girls. She responded, looking defiant. She appeared angry, but refused to talk about it. Exhausted, I looked up the Singapore Stock Exchange. CA was trading at $9.90, representing a slight increase. I went upstairs, waited for Jean to finish in the bathroom, and then prepared for bed. 
When I reached for her, she tensed before pressing against me. Please just hold me, she whispered. I held her for a long time, sensing something was fundamentally wrong. Was it the prolonged separation? Was she out of love or in love with someone else? Was she sick? These thoughts persisted until I fell asleep. I awoke at 430 a.m., tired and sick. I went for a run and intend to purchase melatonin to reset my body clock. After an hour, I returned to find Jean had left, leaving a note asking me to feed the kids and drive them to school. I checked my bank account, saw that the funds from J.P. Morgan had cleared, and transferred them to my offshore account. I checked the cash shares, which were now trading at $8.99 and gradually declining. I had to choose between fixing my marriage and securing my financial future. Can I do both? I spent time with Dean and Kathy, asking about their activities while I was gone. They mentioned spending time with Jean's boss, Anthony Miller, and his daughter, Evelyn, which included activities such as miniature golf and movies. Dean noticed my concern and defended his time with Evelyn, claiming they felt like one big, happy family. I told them I was glad they had a good time and suggested they go on vacation this summer. They were excited, so I hugged and kissed them before driving them to school. Then I called my old mentor, George Tallis, to explain my situation. George, a registered broker, agreed to review the car prospectus I sent him. Later, I stopped by a pharmacy near St. John's Hospital and noticed Jean and Evelyn Miller leaving the hospital, looking distraught. They seemed to be deeply connected in their grief. I wondered if Jean or Evelyn were ill, or if they were mourning a mutual acquaintance. The sight unsettled me, but I went to my meetings. Julian Knowles told me at our first meeting that he had discussed the CIA investment with his club at the second. Aaron Goldstein promptly agreed to invest $10 million. Following the paperwork, George called and said he had interested investors, so we agreed on a sliding commission structure. I then called my father to discuss the CIA opportunity, and he agreed to invest $100,000. When I explained John's behavior, he said it reminded him of someone in mourning. We ruled out her parents and siblings because her cousins were distant. Dad then gave me the phone number of a private investigator they had hired for insurance fraud cases. I returned home, called my contacts in Singapore and Southeast Asia for updates, and recreated the risk assessment profile for the CIA. The results matched my report, which included rational numbers, a strong management team, and an early stage project. Importantly, the management team invested their own money to strengthen my position. Everything was set for the SGX to open, and I would begin trading. While I waited, I contacted Clarence Williams, a private investigator with a slow southern accent and a sharp mind. He required a $5,000 advance and would begin the following day. I drank coffee and waited for the time to pass. Dean and Kathy arrived home late from sports practice, so I spent time with them while explaining my important business. Jean arrived looking tired but determined. I bought Chinese food on the way home, she said, kissing my cheek. Do you work? Hello, Jean. She didn't say anything affectionate, so I didn't respond. I have to work tonight starting around 7 o'clock. Okay, I have a birthday present for you, she said, handing me a small gift-wrapped package. The card read, Happy birthday, Adam. Love, Jean. Inside, there was a bottle of Hugo Boss aftershave. I thanked her, and she kissed my dry lips. We ate as a family. Dean and Kathy discussed their day. Jean mentioned some changes during my absence, like her boss, Anthony Miller, converting his house into a shelter for misused teens. I was surprised, as I thought he was more of a country club type. His wife, Lynn, started it before she died. Jean said he used to use empty houses he owned, but now wants a permanent establishment. Why now? I asked. She became impassive. Now the opportunity has presented itself, she said, nodding. That's a great idea. Springfield could use it, I said, smiling. She smiled back and we cleaned up together. Despite my pleasant expression, I sensed she was hiding something. After cleanup, I told her I was going to work in my office with an hour before trading opened in Singapore. I sat at my desk thinking about my marriage and trying to keep my sanity. Jean and I had once been compatible in every way, but the past few years had been difficult due to my frequent traveling. Usually we planned for my return leading to many honeymoons, but not this time. The situation made me angry. In Singapore and South Asia, many women sought relationships with foreign men for various reasons, and I was hit on daily. 
However, I turned them down because I was married to a woman I loved. But recent events made me question our relationship. Reflecting on any warning signs, I realized that aside from a breakdown in communication over the past few weeks, there wasn't much. But now I had to focus on the work at hand. When the Singapore market opened, California was trading at $8.49 with over $30 million to invest. I cautiously began buying stocks. Despite my purchases, the price kept falling as investors tried to offload their shares. I suspected my old company was dumping shares. I kept buying, expecting the price to stabilize, but it plummeted to $5.61 with our $30 million. We bought over 10% of the shares, allowing us to appoint someone to the board of directors. I called George and we celebrated over whiskey, an 18-year-old JP wiser for me and a 10-year-old bullet, bourbon for George. Our purchases encouraged other investors to buy at the bargain price, and by the time I logged off, the price had climbed to $8.72, stranding short sellers. It was almost 2 a.m. I quickly cleaned up and went to bed, finally passing out from the melatonin pills. The next morning, I woke up late. Dean and Kathy were finishing breakfast, and Jean was on the phone saying, Time is of the essence. She ended the call when she saw me working. Jean shrugged exaggeratedly and poured me a cup of coffee. You must have been up late. I nodded, sipping my coffee. Did the trade go well? I mimicked her shrug, keeping my worries about cash to myself. It's still early. We will have to wait and see. Okay, she kissed my cheek. You seem tired. I'll take the kids to school. She left, calling out to Dean and Kathy. They shouted, bye and love you, daddy. As they left, I poured another cup and headed to my office. I'm pleased to see the stock closed at $10.14 after a late rally. It was time to stabilize the stock away from hostile games. I washed my face and started emailing and making calls, first checking the Miller Real Estate website. It promoted its social responsibility program, New Horizons House, helping troubled teens. I found Anthony Miller's Facebook filled with pictures of cars, vacations, and a recent corporate event photo with Gene holding his hand. Looking at him instead of the photographer, it was curious but not definitive. Jean's Facebook was mostly old family photos, with nothing much recent. Evelyn's Facebook showed many pictures with Jean over the years, some with Anthony too, but nothing inappropriate. Her recent posts were cryptic about life and prayers. I called Clarence Williams to expedite the investigation, but he said it would take time. I called my father, who advised against jumping to conclusions and to let the experts handle it. He told me to be patient. I was torn. Should I try to fix my marriage, risking more heartache if I was being played, or do nothing and regret it later? I called a lawyer who advised that fixing the marriage was usually better than divorce. I had one more idea. I contacted a former colleague of Jean's, Chad, who owed me a favor. He agreed to meet for lunch at Red Robin. He walked in, looking every bit the realtor in his golf shirt, chinos, and dockers. After small talk over burgers, I got down to business. So you're fishing for information, Adam? Chad laughed. I nodded, yeah. I'm trying to understand something about MRR. Something's been bothering me. Chad turned serious. Everything changed when Tony lost his wife to cancer. He lost his drive for a while, but his daughter took over and he eventually found his footing again. He looked at me shrewdly. Your wife? She became very close to him, often referred to as his office wife. I gestured for him to continue, my throat tight. I didn't see anything inappropriate. But office gossip can be cruel. Tony, Evelyn, and your wife spent a lot of time together. But you weren't home much, were you? I shrugged. We talked about it without adding anything new. Chad was about to leave when he remembered something. Did you know Anthony was rumored to have cancer? We said goodbye and I called St. John's Hospital asking for Anthony Miller's room. He was in the oncology ward. I paid for lunch and headed home with a lot to think about. That evening, I went outside with whiskey and a charcuterie board. Jean joined me with a glass of wine. Can we talk, Adam? Shoot. You went on the Emory website, she accused. Why does it matter? Why did you go to the company's website? And I assume you've checked everyone's Facebook pages, too? She glared at me, daring me to argue. We'd been married long enough for me to recognize the signs. What did you expect to find? Exactly what I found. And what was that? Why are you questioning me, Jane? Social media isn't private. I laughed and she blushed. Evelyn said you checked her Instagram? Really? 
Yeah, she tried to stay calm. Why are you acting like this? How? Like this? Why? I blew smoke in her direction, knowing she hated it. She waved it away, spilling wine on her blouse. Please stop, Adam. She began to cry. Normally I would have hugged her, but not this time. Why are you crying, Jean? You're upsetting me with your behavior, Adam. She grew louder, but I let out more smoke. Who are you? I asked. She struggled for words. I am your wife, Adam Carter. That's who I am. I stepped back as she gasped and ran into the house. I finished my drink and went to my office. Sears stock was rising to $11.92. George and I agreed it was a trend, not a spike. I monitored the market, noticing CA was the only stock with significant upward movement. A JP Morgan team member admitted they dumped half the stock at 0.50 sen on the dollar. My former boss, Joe Ratliff, suggested holding the rest as the trend looked positive. We laughed. He hinted that JP Morgan might rehire me and fire Routledge. That night, I slept on the couch in my office. The next morning, I saw a car closed at $13. The trend continued, and our investors doubled their money. If it reached $25, we'd see a 300% profit. I made breakfast, drank coffee, and called the kids to eat. Ignoring Jean all morning after dropping them off at school, I went to the gym and then to IHOP for a late breakfast. I made some calls and had a two-hour meeting with George when I got home. We discussed starting a combined brokerage with offices in Springfield and Chicago. George would focus on the structure and equity while I devised a marketing strategy. I was working on the plan when Jean came in alone, I left Kathy and Dean at the Beckers for the night. We need to talk. She poured me a bourbon and drank a glass of wine. We sat in the living room, waiting for her to speak. First, I'm not sure what you think I've been doing while you've been away, Adam. I haven't thought of anything yet. Well, you're being extremely disrespectful and ugly to me. Is that the way you feel? I raised an eyebrow. Disrespectful. She nodded and apologized. You're not at home anymore. We are like two strangers. So after 17 years, we are strangers because I have been gone for four months. All the Skype texts and phone calls were meaningless. There was a great deal of pressure on me, and you were far away. She wiped away tears. But you are my husband, and I am your wife, and that is all that matters. She stood and walked away. I sipped my bourbon and wondered if she had lost her mind. I overheard her on the phone. Then came the sound of water from the bathtub. Later, she descended the stairs in a gray dress, black shoes, and a string of pearls. I had bought her. Go take a shower and get dressed, she said. I'll make a reservation at the Chesapeake Seafood Restaurant. I got ready in 15 minutes. I ignored my suspicions that she was on the phone again at the restaurant. She had a gin and tonic while I ordered a Singapore gin sling. We chatted about the kids over Chardonnay and appetizers. She didn't seem concerned about me losing my job. Adam, you're one of the smartest people I know. I believe you will find work quickly, she smiled at me. She had no idea that our future depended on the CIA. The evening improved as we talked about friends, parents, and everyday issues. When our main courses arrived, I ordered the captain's platter and she got lobster. She bought me wine and we enjoyed each other's company. If she was having an affair, she went for it. Well, we finished our meal and headed home. I awoke to the aroma of coffee and bacon. Jean was preparing breakfast, scrambled eggs with bacon and English muffins. We ate together and talked about household chores. After breakfast, she went to get Dean and Kathy. I was in the backyard when my phone rang. It was Clarence Williams. Can you speak? He asked, and my heart sank. We planned to meet at a downtown coffee shop. I left work, cleaned up, and met him. He waved when he noticed me. It was not what I expected. Unlike the detectives on television, he was a small, unassuming man, no taller than five feet seven, with thin gray hair and balding. He wore dark pants, a shirt, and an old sports jacket, and his shoes looked like they came from Walmart. He was probably driving a Toyota. However, his high-end cell phone did not match his outward appearance, and his firm handshake revealed his true personality. He got right to the point. Mr. Carter. We didn't catch your wife at a hotel or in any secret meetings, he said, raising his hand to prevent me from interrupting. But we have ample evidence that she has been having an affair with her boss, Anthony Miller, for at least two years. It's an open secret at the office. 
His daughter Evelyn is aware of the situation and helps to facilitate it. Your wife frequently left the kids with friends to spend weekends with him while you were away. His words hit me hard, and my heart raced. My hands clutched the table as if I were experiencing a heart attack. Clarence continued, but I could barely hear him. Miller was diagnosed with aggressive pancreatic cancer and has only a few months to live. What? I inquired, trying to process. He's going through therapy, but it's not working. He has metastatic pancreatic cancer. This confirmed what had been hinted at, and Jean's behavior suddenly made sense. She was mourning the man she loved and trying to cope with his impending death. I told Clarence that I needed to talk to someone. Clarence's next words confirmed my initial impressions about his death. Cheaters frequently try to justify their actions by claiming that it was simply physical engagement. But that is nonsense, Mr. Carter. They are invested in the relationship. Women need to feel loved. Long-term relationships are about more than just physical engagement. They entail sharing stories, hopes, and dreams. They develop a personal language and justify their actions by criticizing their spouses. I was devastated. My wife was in a relationship with another man, giving him her undivided attention and enjoying the good times without the stresses of everyday life. He provided her with the excitement that had been missing from our marriage. We talked some more and decided to pause the investigation while I thought about my next steps. After he left, I sat and thought about my life. One thing was clear. My marriage was over. It no longer made sense to stay together for the sake of the children. As difficult as it was to admit, I knew that many children in the United States live in separated or divorced families, and mine would be no exception. I sipped my cooling coffee while feeling intense pain inside. Gene and Miller would pay for it. I tried to contain my emotions. Anger, hurt, and anguish would not help. I recalled my work in the Far East where traditional executives like Southern Europeans saw business and life in multi-generational terms. When two families went to war, there was no respite until one was exterminated. But I was not a triad leader or mafia boss, just an ordinary man leading an ordinary life. I didn't have any superpowers or omnipotent allies. I asked for more coffee and considered how to exact revenge on a dying man. Jean found it simple. Take everything she values. First, I needed to deal with Miller. He was not married to me, but he showed disrespect for my marriage and family. My rage flared up again at work. Psychological evaluations revealed two characteristics. I was risk-averse and obstinate to the point of intransigence. These characteristics motivated me now. I would retaliate regardless of the consequences and refuse to back down until one side had been defeated, even if it were me. An embryo of a plan began to form. I called Clarence and asked him to find some troubled women. The Millers had helped. It was yet another fishing trip, but this time I had bigger goals. In 2014, while traveling to Kenya, I joined a local team that went deep sea fishing in the Indian Ocean. To catch a marlin, I learned that you must first catch small fish such as bonito and use them as live bait before catching the marlin itself. That lesson helped me make a plan. I drove home, practiced breathing exercises to calm down, and pretended to be in the same mood as before. Jean was not home, so I completed my tasks. Later, she returned with Dean and Kathy, and we grilled steaks, corn on the cob, coleslaw, and warmed baguettes. I spent the day acting like a loving father and husband, but on the inside, I was a cynical fool. Adam, a cynic, concluded that Jean was doing damage control because her lover was dying. I was her backup plan. My time with Dean and Kathy was authentic, but my time with Jean was like a B-movie. Cynical Adam reminded me to keep this in mind throughout the divorce and when looking for new relationships. The following few days were strange, living a lie while watching myself perform a role. On a positive note, George and I organized the new trading organization, registered it in Singapore, and transferred the CIA portfolio. Following the roller coaster ride, CIA traded at $16.33. We'd more than doubled our investment and were looking at a threefold return. Given how easily I had adopted my cold, calculated persona, I became paranoid. I implemented security measures that required a fingerprint and password, encrypted all of my files and emails, and always turned off my laptop. I deleted all emails that were not from George without opening them. 
I uploaded needed files to the cloud, reformatted my phone, and re-uploaded necessary data. I researched other interesting stocks and contacted potential J.P. Morgan investors, confident that the layoff would nullify my non-compete clause. On Thursday, Clarence delivered the ammunition. I was waiting for a flash drive containing information about 14 women whom the Millers had helped. Due to my heightened paranoia, the handover took place at a different coffee shop. The flash drive contained brief bios and old photographs. Five women still lived nearby. Layla worked as an escort. I purchased a cell phone, called her, and agreed to meet at a motel. Layla arrived on time, small, thin, and tattooed. Show me the money, she said. I put $200 on the bed and asked, how would you feel about making a thousand? She initially refused, but when I explained that I wanted information, she agreed to speak. Layla shared her story. She left home after school, ended up on the streets, and began selling herself to get food and shelter. Following a traumatic incident, she was transported to the hospital and then to Mrs. Miller's house, where she stayed for six months before leaving due to boredom with the rules. I asked if she had ever been bullied at home. She hesitated before asking how much. I offered $5,000. She negotiated skillfully, requesting $20,000 to help her and her daughter start anew. I promised her a job in Chicago if everything went well, and her eyes lit up. For real? She inquired, both hopeful and scared. I reassured her, and we worked out a plan. We exchanged numbers, and I saved mine under the name Jerry. Phase one was complete. At home, I maintained my facade, and John seemed to buy it. She was too focused on the Miller Legacy Project to notice much else. I gathered as much information as I could without raising suspicion. We cooked dinner together like old times. During breakfast, she mentioned she'd be busy with New Horizons House and that the grand opening was on Monday at 10. I already knew from the company website and social media. I feigned interest and subtly questioned her, learning the mayor and local media would attend. Did they stop the chemo and radiation so Tony could feel well enough to attend? She asked someone, probably Evelyn. She then sobbed slightly. It's going to be a life-changing moment. Not if I could help it. My divorce papers were ready, awaiting permission to file. Illinois was a no-fault state, so it was a matter of irreconcilable differences. I started the day checking the SGX. Our stock had reached its issue price and was rising. A good start to Friday. I listened to my radio at 930, where Evelyn discussed the New Horizons house, praising its social responsibility and calling for community participation and donations. Then a hesitant caller broke the smooth narrative through sobs, she revealed. Please don't believe the house helped anyone. It allowed Mr. Miller to misuse women. Evelyn denied it vehemently, defending her father. The caller continued he did, and more than once. I'm a strumpet now. Thanks to your beloved father. My name is Layla and your father ruined me. The connection cut off and the station went to a commercial break. When they returned, the host was torn between continuing the original interview and addressing the shocking revelation. Evelyn tried to explain it away, but the lines were ringing with listeners' reactions. Some defended Layla while others dismissed her as trying to make a buck. Another caller, Rita, said Anthony Miller misused me to adding more fuel to the fire. A married woman with children called in, sobbing because Miller had stressed her out and forced her to do things she couldn't refuse. She disconnected, leaving a long silence before the host, who sounded like he was crying, could speak. The public's reaction was one of outrage and defense, transforming a low-interest story into an emotional storm. I called Vicky, an old high school friend who works at the local newspaper and anchors the news for two regional radio stations. I asked if she had heard about what was happening on WMCA, and she had. I told her I was concerned because my wife works for MRH in the New Horizons Home Project. She wasn't sure, but said she would look into it, noting that if true, it would be the biggest misuse case in Springfield in two generations. By lunchtime, the story had quieted on the air, but social media and Twitter went wild. Initially, opinions were split evenly, but soon it became a fierce witch hunt against Miller. Thousands of women shared their misused stories. Some were detailed, others just me too, and some were graphic. The information went viral globally. I passed out with a massive headache, took Tylenol and feeling dirty, took a shower where I broke down crying harder than I had since my mom died. 
I realized I had unleashed a firestorm that was now out of control. Nietzsche's saying about becoming a monster by fighting monsters felt apartment. All I could do now was hang on and pray. I picked up Dean and Kathy, made chicken stir-fry, and waited for Jean. She didn't come home and her phone was off. We ate and played a board game. Jean finally came home around ten, looking devastated. You heard? She sighed. Have you heard all the nasty things they say about Tony? She collapsed into a chair. I handed her a brandy. Yeah, sounds like your boss is a carnivore, I said evenly. Where there's smoke, there's fire. No, Adam. He's a good man. He would never do anything like this. Time to get to phase two. Jean. She looked up. You don't know the man very well. You don't know me. I pressed on you and I have no secrets. We're husband and wife, so you know what I'm capable of. Just like I know you. I held her gaze. You may know Miller as your boss, but who knows what he's really like. Her face was filled with conflicting emotions. No, he is a good man. He'd never do that. I'd know. How do you know, Gene? He is your boss, your co-worker. He could be concealing a million secrets. He always seemed to be hiding something. He's not the type of person you'd leave alone with your wife or daughters. She exhaled. And he, you understand. Has he ever tried anything on you? She turned white, and I pretended not to notice. No, never. How are you even asking that? She attempted to be snarky, but ended up looking perplexed. Because you are a beautiful woman, Jean. If what they say about him is accurate, you must be extremely immoral. She burst into tears and stared into her glass of brandy. She could not find the answers she sought. She finished it and went upstairs, tired, to say goodnight to Dean and Kathy. I overheard the shower running. I finished my cognac and went to bed, pretending to be half asleep. When she returned, she was talking to someone, most likely Evelyn, and mentioned nightmares several times. She wondered why there weren't more women speaking up and acknowledged that it wouldn't go away easily. She was correct. She placed a second call. Hello, Anthony, she said. I overheard snippets in which she reassured him that everything was a misunderstanding and would be resolved. I barely heard her move into the kitchen, but I caught her final words. I also love you. I heard the microwave beep, so she probably snacked alone before bed. By the time she arrived, I had fallen asleep. Saturday, I got up first, made breakfast, and drove Dean and Kathy to sports practice at home. I spoke with Vicky, who informed me that four women had come forward. According to her sources, the mayor's office and civic associations were both distancing themselves from the project, which they deemed toxic. By mid-morning, the attorney general had announced a full investigation. I spoke with George about business and my father about my marriage. He agreed that it was irretrievably broken, but Dean and Kathy would manage, like many children in the United States. I called Jean. Where are you, Evelyn? The company's lawyers and I are fighting these lawsuits. Are you certain you should be involved? I inquired with concern. The consequences could be significant. She resisted, as expected. Marie had less than 20% of its usual show attendance that weekend. By Monday, the phones were ringing with canceled orders, and the New Horizons opening had been postponed. On Monday, another woman came forward. She was married to a wealthy businessman and well-known in her community. She claimed Miller mistreated her twice during her eight-day stay at the house. She left her lawyer's information for a class-action lawsuit. By the end of the week, five events had occurred. Miller was interviewed by the district attorney at the hospital, and his condition deteriorated. Second, three of the five women testified to police about assaults that occurred approximately five years ago. Third, the media storm forced me to close the doors. Fourth, California stock surpassed $24 and I began selling shares, recouping our initial investment while keeping two-thirds of the stock. Fifth, my father took Dean and Kathy out for the weekend. To celebrate with Jim, I purchased a bottle of 2012 Vintage Calico. When I got home, I noticed an MSI-branded BMW X5 parked beside Jean's Lexus inside. Jean was crying, and Evelyn was comforting her ladies. I greeted them, then took three champagne flutes and popped the cork. I refilled the glasses and handed them out. They looked at me in shock. Salute. I toasted, drank half, then burped. Then the shouting started. Jean, you are divorcing me. I assumed we were a family. The divorce papers lay open on the coffee table. Evelyn, how could you? Adam, don't you care about your wife? Don't you love her? Have a drink, Jean. 
We are celebrating the end of an era. I finished the champagne and reached for the bottle. First of all, Evelyn, I could and did. Second, I stopped caring and loving her once she became your father's strumpet. I tipped over my glass and toasted Evelyn. Let's toast to your father's legacy. I hope he lives long enough to stand trial so that the world can see what a jerk he truly is. She turned white and collapsed. I turned to Jean. Get yourself a lawyer. The children will remain with my father until custody is established. Her eyes widened in fear as she saw a side of me she'd never seen before. Evelyn dropped her flute and spilled champagne. They looked at me as if I were a madman with a gun. Would you like some champagne? No. You left me alone for so long that I needed human contact. Jean attempted to justify, but she couldn't meet my gaze. I understand. I laughed heartily. And how do you handle that now? Evelyn attacked me again. What number of women did you sleep with while you were away? Men always expect their women to be angels while they do whatever they want. Don't think that all men behave like your father. Just because he ruined young women's lives and marriages does not imply that the rest of us are on his level. I looked at her, hoping she would object. I leaned in. Your father is a mall trader, a felon, and a pig. He'll probably die before going to prison, but his reputation will be ruined. His legacy project will never succeed. His money will be involved in lawsuits. MRR will become bankrupt, and you'll have to change your name and relocate far away. She trembled and cried. I wished she were a man so that I could express my rage. Evelyn, you probably helped lure these girls in the same way that Ghislaine Maxwell did for Jeffrey Epstein. Her mouth opened in horror. No, this is all a lie. My father is a good man. I turned to Jean. You've got two hours to pack and leave. If you're still here when I get back, I'll contact the press and ask them to interview you about your involvement. Screw you, she spat. I'll move out, but first I'll hire a lawyer and then we'll see who receives what. Two hours, I repeated. I drove away, but a few blocks later, the adrenaline caught up with me, and I had to pull over, gasping and shaking. After about 15 minutes, I regained control and called my father. I informed him of Jean's departure and asked him to keep Dean and Kathy with him. Jean could pay them a visit, but not spend time alone with them. We talked, and I drove around aimlessly before getting gas and returning home. By the time I returned, it was 10 o'clock. The house felt like a mausoleum filled with ghosts from happier times. The silence was deafening, and I could not sleep. Socrates stated that an unexamined life is not worth living. However, I avoided in-depth examinations of my psyche. I knew things had gotten too far and couldn't be stopped. I was concerned about what might happen if the situation went to court, so I decided to get Layla out of town and cut off my direct connection. The next morning, I felt just as tired as when I went to bed after my morning routine. I ate breakfast downtown and called the kids. They were fine. Dean suspected there was something wrong over coffee. I contacted Layla. Did I deliver on my promise? She asked. I confirmed that she had. We scheduled her flight to Chicago the following day. I transferred $25,000 from my offshore account to one of George's, which then went to her new bank account. Layla was off to work as a property management assistant, arranged by one of George's contacts. I was on my second cup of coffee when Vicky called. Miller has been sued by three women who are seeking damages. The paperwork will be served on Monday. We spoke for a while. The timing and manner in which the story unfolded surprised both her and the news editors. But given the current climate, it was not surprising. Layla, who claimed to be a courtesan, gained attention. Others followed much like in the Harvey Weinstein case. I spent the remainder of Saturday with Dean and Kathy. I told them their mother and I were divorcing because she was having an affair with Anthony Miller, her boss. Kathy did not understand, but Dean did. She slept with Mr. Miller. Dad. I nodded sadly. Yes, they have been together for a while, Kathy cried, but Dean remained unconcerned. We went to the golf course with my father and hit some buckets of balls. Dean and Kathy used my old clubs and had a nice natural swing. We had dinner at a Greek restaurant and then went to bed. I returned to my quiet, lonely home and spent another sleepless night. On Sunday, her parents called, hoping for a resolution for the sake of the child. How can I reconcile with a woman who has been having an affair for several years? I asked, particularly with a maniac like Miller. They sighed and I assured them it would be resolved in court.
they were left with a shattered image of their daughter. Life continued slowly and painfully. Dean and Kathy moved back in with me, and my father moved in to help my business grow after George and I received positive feedback. Vicky informed me that a fourth woman had joined the lawsuit against Miller, but not Layla, which I found strange. I met with Jean's lawyers about property division. I had set up investment accounts for Dean and Kathy's education, using our combined assets, which couldn't be touched. My last paycheck and J.P. Morgan payments went to my offshore account. Her lawyer suspected a golden handshake, but didn't know how much. It was only a matter of time before they subpoenaed the HR records. I offered Jean nothing because she had a good job. She claimed there should be at least $250,000 in cash and near-cash assets. I assured them that it was lost on unprofitable stocks. Jean and her lawyer made ridiculous statements. But I laughed. Accept the offer, Jean, or I will fight until you run out of money for lawyers. I'll ruin your finances. Why are you acting like an idiot? She asked. I deserve half of whatever remains of our marriage. Go to your second husband and ask for money. You had a more committed relationship with him than with me. But hurry, he may not have any money left after those women receive what they deserve. It went on for months. Jean's stance varied from meeting to meeting. She claimed I portrayed her relationship with Miller as more serious than it was. Then she blamed me for her actions, offered to reconcile, and finally threatened to take me to the cleaners. Her lawyer stated that he would have her back in the house immediately. I gave her a big grin. Be careful, Jean, or I will reveal your involvement in this. She became pale. Try it and see what happens. As I was leaving the lawyer's office, I noticed Evelyn glaring at me. I smiled at her as if she were the walking dead. Her smile wavered. Evelyn, you should have stayed out of this. You reap what you sow. Two days later, Lila was $5,000 richer, and local newspapers, Twitter, and social media were ablaze with revelations about Evelyn Miller's involvement with her disgraced father, Anthony Miller. The district attorney's office faced criticism for failing to arrest Miller or take action against his daughter. In a media briefing, the DA's office stated that the investigation was still in its early stages, but the press did not back down, and another storm erupted. The public, still reeling from the Ghislaine Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein scandal, quickly focused on Evelyn Miller, who was sued by four women, making me increasingly anxious and sleepless. Going to court posed a significant risk and could derail everything. Six weeks after I returned from Singapore, the doorbell rang. It was Evelyn. What do you need? I asked bluntly. Can we speak, Adam? No, I do not want to be associated with a carnivore like you. I closed the door, but she called again, begging to speak. Where are your entitlement cows? I thought, but said. I do not think so. You only want to record me. I promise I won't. Good. Her eyes brightened, but I stopped her. Place your purse and phone in the car first. I set my phone to record. Okay, talk. She appeared unsure whether to stand or sit, but eventually settled on the edge of the couch. I know it's you, Adam. You instigated this nightmare. I looked at her without emotion. Stop it. Adam. I remained silent as she changed the subject. Your claims about my father are false. They need to be disproven. I laughed. There is nothing I can do. It is now up to the court. Thank you, Adam. I am confident you will be able to stop this. Your world has collapsed. You want my help? Where were you while your father was with my wife? Her face flushed. Oh, yes, you were helping, making certain she agreed to be your father's strumpet. We stared silently. Finally, she asked, When will you feel satisfied? Not until your family has been completely destroyed. Evelyn, she shivered. There will be no stopping, no ceasefire, and no peace. I spoke slowly to ensure she understood this was not a game. She realized the truth and fell silent before surprising me by asking, You want to take revenge on me? How? She held her hands together, unable to meet my gaze, staggering. She laughed and dashed to her BMW. I watched her drive away, feeling both pleased and disgusted by my cruelty. Even though it was early, I wanted a drink. I spent the rest of the week in and out of law offices, working with new clients. George and I were conducting research on potential listings on the Hong Kong and Johannesburg stock markets. The four women's class action suit against Miller was in full swing. The Millers, led by Evelyn and her attorneys, were attempting to settle outside of court. The Da struggled to prosecute a man on his end of the rope. 
so we waited. The millers had been nearly depleted, and each of the women received more than two million dollars. This marked the end of MRR. I needed one more thing to finish my revenge. So I went to the hospital and entered Miller's room, dressed professionally and walking as if I belonged there. Nobody stopped me. I wanted him to understand who had ruined him and his legacy. He survived for two more days. Evelyn had him cremated and only five people attended the small ceremony, including Jean. She intended to take Dean and Kathy with her. I told her I'd see you die first. Would you? She responded with a mixture of fear and hatred, similar to Evelyn's last expression. You ruined him, didn't you? All because he and I were in a relationship. You went insane and ruined so many lives. She cried. I laughed sharply. Jean, you planted the seeds. Why didn't you simply tell me you wanted someone else? We could have gotten divorced, but you chose to ignore me. She confessed quietly. I adore Tony. He gave me what I needed. With you, it seemed like your job came first. Then we had Dean and Kathy, and I felt even more neglected. I could have walked away, but I did not. I played a recording from my phone. Was it worthwhile? I asked. No. Miller wheezed. You ruined everything I'd worked for. It's your fault, Miller. I messed you up big time. How did you find out that I used them? He asked. I began laughing uncontrollably. I didn't know, Miller. I thought I was making things up. But I now understand why those women pursued you. It all popped open with a single crack. Carter, screw you, he panted. Those women owed me. He tried sitting up. Jean collapsed on the floor in shock. I walked away, leaving her behind. When Mickey sold assets to free up cash, I purchased the house they were converting into a New Horizons home for next to nothing. I announced that I would turn it into a full-fledged shelter for abused women. I renamed it Joy Carter House after my mother and put it in trust with my father and the four women who sued Miller as trustees. They contributed to the project and the media praised us throughout the divorce. Jean received primary custody and I paid alimony until Dean and Kathy turned 18. She could stay in the house, but she had to contribute 50% of the mortgage. Her alimony was zero. When she accused me of hiding money, I threatened her and she relented. She became extremely cautious around me. We eventually got divorced. I purchased a three-bedroom condo so the kids could stay with me. I had them almost every weekend because Jean was busy selling houses. I missed them when I traveled to the Far East on a regular basis, but life wasn't too bad in general. I laughed at myself. Things were difficult, but manageable. Jean's relationship with Evelyn ended as soon as I showed her the videotape of my confrontation with Miller. I also circulated an edited version of the tape that included her father's confession. This developed a life of its own. Evelyn left a few months later, and I didn't hear from her again. Layla, born Leon Roxton, and I met in Chicago. She'd cleaned up and was enjoying her job. Did you know? I asked. It was like an open secret, she explained. There was no direct admission of misuse. Everybody was afraid. Being kicked out onto the street would be worse. Why haven't you told me? I asked. She laughed. I had no idea. I wasn't abused. I contacted a few women and offered them $5,000 to claim they were abused. She glared at me, daring me to object, but I did not. Rita French, the second woman I contacted, broke down on the phone. She was the first to call the radio station when Miller's daughter appeared on air. The Me Too movement grew organically from there. You could have earned so much money. I sympathized. She shakes her head. By the time they sued Miller, I was in Chicago and out of the picture. But you gave me a good start on them. Thank you. My vengeance was complete and my actions seemed justifiable. The Millers were destroyed as if they were characters in a story. I learned about revenge and carried it out in ways I never imagined. Financially, things were looking up. The business was expanding, and George suggested that I buy him out for retirement. Dean and Kathy coped well, focusing on school, friends, and sports. Life went on for about four years following the divorce. Jean started dating an older man. They eventually married Dean, and Kathy described him as a nice guy. I remained single and wasn't seriously dating anyone, most likely due to ongoing trust issues. My father insisted that I see a trauma counselor and begin improving my life. However, I still had a long way to go. Here is the next story. In the previous installment, Kelly persuaded her friends to try to seduce her husband, James, who declined their advances. 
suspicious of his wife's intentions and potential adultery, he begins to make plans for his own well-being. Let us now move on to the next part of the story. So that's what I did. I placed the folder on the table in front of Kelly. Open the folder and raid what is inside. When I get out of the shower, we can talk. See, I wear the pants in my family. Always have, always will. I never got to finish taking a shower. What is this, Jim? Kelly's piercing shrill echoed through the glass partition. I said, we'll talk about it when I finish washing. No, Jim, get your bloody face out here right now and tell me what's bothering you, she ranted. Okay, she'll tell me which ones. Please don't give me that look. I doubt there is a husband out there who has not heard the old criticism. You aren't wearing that, are you? You are an idiot if you believe that is a question. This is not a question, mate. This is a statement. So, which is it? I'm in charge here. And you should take notice. Now suppose you're a typical, logical, but clueless male. The answer is right in front of her face. I have them on, woman. What are your thoughts? That was a bad move, mate. You're not conversing with another man here, and you're staring at a lonely night in another drawer. If you walk out the door with them on. I know I said I learned not to throw matches early in my marriage, but this is an exception to that rule. I don't like odds on. That is crazy. That's a big minimal return. As previously stated, this is crazy. You have to go for the long shot. 50 cents down for 50 buckaroos and your steak. The pants deal is shit, and keeping the missus happy is crucial here. I will give you a hint. Change your pants and hope to hell she's in a loving mood later in the night. And you might just get a reverse draw. There are no guarantees, though. It all depends on why she confronted you about your pants in the first place. Then it could be a 2-0 loss for you. But hey, you haven't lost much. But a bad pair of comfortable pants. But that wasn't the reason I sighed and turned off the water. What? Why did I succumb then? Oh, my uncle is watching the gridiron. And he has tried to teach me some of the rules, poor bugger. According to my uncle, all I did was drop back, open the field, and throw the long pass to the wide receiver. I believe you gridiron fans understand what I'm saying here. The rest of you are tough titties. And now I understand why I get sidetracked all the time. I'm trying to connect my thoughts on life's mysteries to the married woman. So sit back and suck it up. It might just help you draw the next match and possibly win one or two. Now back to the confrontation. I took my towel off the hook. You have read the forms. It means exactly what it says on the top of page one, prenuptial agreements. It is the one we signed before getting married. But I just added a codicil. This is me stepping back. I damn well read it. We don't need a bloody codicil to an already ridiculous prenup. She's angry again. What we need is for you to get your head out of your buttocks and apologize to me right now. Getting angry and swearing at me won't help the situation. Kelly, go downstairs and open a bottle of wine. We'll sit down and discuss this like mature adults. So just give me some peace and quiet while I get dressed. I can remain calm when necessary. On the outside. On the interior. I wanted to kill something. My quarterback is dancing on the spot, nervously waiting for the wide receiver to gain ground. Kelly turned and stormed out of the bedroom. Open your own damn bottle of wine. I'm too angry to talk to you right now. I'm going outside to cool down, so please don't wait up. I got clobbered and my throw came up short. I walked out and lay down on my back on the bed, staring at the ceiling, much like my quarterback is doing right now. Get my own dinner. Get my own wine. I don't even like drinking wine. I'm a beer guy. I was trying to be nice. And where did it lead me? How about I get my own damn life? I yelled down from the bedroom. I hope she did not hear that. My wide receiver missed the ball. The game is over. And no nookie tonight. Damn, I hate football. Give me rugby league any day. Kelly arrived home around 10 that night, as far as I could tell. There was a clatter downstairs, as if she was bouncing off anything she could find to fall into before collapsing onto the bed. Not even removing a single stitch. Clothing. There was no conversation or goodnight kiss. Not even a grunt and she smelled like rum. She simply turned her back on me and went to sleep. I passed out. This is more like it. She was comatose and didn't move all night. I know I didn't get much sleep all night. I was in the kitchen, pouring my first cup of coffee. Kelly staggered in, feeling as if death had warmed up before leaving for work. Oh, God, I am dying. I almost chuckled, thinking that tired wasn't so bad this early in the morning. So this is what it looks like on the other side of a hangover. Morning, Kelly. 
You look like hell, darling, or something. The cat dragged one of the two. I knew she couldn't fight this morning, so I felt free to add, can we discuss the agreement this afternoon or not? I know it was an opportunistic move, but as Bob Hudson's song New Castle says, never pass up an opportunity, especially when they are served to you on a plate like this. Kelly moaned, despite having a thundering headache from drinking too much the night before. I'm in no condition to discuss it right now. She said this while folding her arms on the table, her hair brushed to a high sheen. This morning, it looked more like a rat's nest. Half of me felt bad for her. The other half wished to punch the air and scream, yes. Instead, I expressed my understanding and went to work, thinking I was relieved the roles were not reversed. So far, everything had gone as Leonard and I expected. Leonard predicted that Kelly would object at first, but if she had nothing to hide and truly loved me, she would eventually agree to the change in the agreement. I still felt bad about it, but I accepted that while love made for a cohesive marriage, it was far from an airtight seal, and other sinister forces could, in moments of weakness, destroy the delicate fabric. I realize my cynicism is showing. But think about it. If she didn't sign, it was more evidence that she had already been unfaithful, and I had no desire to end her affairs. I adore Kelly, but if that were the case, I'd have to consider taking things to the next level and having her followed. As I drove home, I had a sinking feeling because I knew I had to deal with a confrontation with my dear wife. I half expected to see a car-filled driveway and was mildly surprised to find it wasn't a parking lot. As the garage door opened, I was even more surprised to find Kelly's car still inside. Coming in from the garage, I noticed Kelly in surprise number three. Kelly wasn't next door, but in the lounge with two glasses of wine and the agreement on the coffee table, I took a deep breath and told myself that it was showtime. Don't back down now that you're 100 to 1. Long shot, baby. Kelly had the good grace to wait until I finished before putting my briefcase away and undoing my tie. I thought we could use a little relaxation before we get started. She pointed to the forms on the table. You're probably correct, sweetheart. Let me start by saying that I am not happy about having to do this. But after hearing my reasons, I believe you will agree that it will not have a negative impact on our marriage. Kelly sipped her wine, frowning. I'm not sure how you can say that, James. It reeks of distrust, to say the least. Are you saying that you no longer trust me? I picked up my wine. I told you I hated wine, didn't I? But he took a gulp and sat on the couch beside her. It gave me pause to wonder if Kelly was capitulating, and the wine was her way of expressing her displeasure with losing this round. No, sweetheart. I am not saying that. I knew in my heart that that was only half the truth. I trusted Kelly, but I wasn't sure how far. And it made me angry. I never expected to have these thoughts. Yes, I am concerned that something isn't right between us, and I want to make it right. All of this allows us to remove any variable from the equation. I took Kelly's hand and held it. I have an apology to make, and I would appreciate it if you could hear me out before interrupting. Kelly nodded her agreement, but my skeptical side reared its ugly head. I knew what she was thinking to herself, or at least I thought I did. I only want to hear apologies from you, James. It was written all over her face, but she kept it to herself. I continued. All of this, I believe, has occurred as a result of my careless disclosure of my fantasy. I believe this has made you uncomfortable and unsettled in our relationship. I sincerely apologize, and I ask for your forgiveness. I drank another long sip of wine. God, it tasted like cat's piss, and Kelly's smirky expression must have revealed my dislike. I believe that confession of a threesome led you to believe that you were in danger of losing me, which is ridiculous, sweetheart. But I understand what you were thinking. If I agreed to let you do this for me, you'd be a cock. Kelly sat blankly for a minute, staring at me before her face screwed up in confusion. What is that? I chuckled at her question. A cock, my dear Kelly. In your case, the female equivalent of a cock. A woman who allows her husband to sleep with other women while she either observes or participates. Whatever. I saw her start to object, so I cut her off. Before you say it, I'm not interested in an open marriage either. I'm hoping that this change to the prenuptial agreement will allay your fears and allow us to resume our loving relationship. I miss your gentle touch and smiling face, my love. 
Okay, so I was laying it on thick, and it sounded like I was, but all I wanted was for her to think it was heartfelt, which it was. Don't kill me over this. I fought for my marriage and future family. Give me a break. Kelly's face dropped as if she was experiencing sadness. I'm sure she wasn't expecting this, but she still smiled. You're stupid, silly sausage. I was never concerned about you leaving me, sweetie. I just wanted you to live your fantasy. I apologize for not discussing this with you sooner. I asked our friends if they would help me bring it about. That was my mistake. I apologize as well. My mood brightened, and I smiled. You don't have anything to apologize for, dear. It was a nice thought, and I appreciate you thinking about me. But, as I previously stated, I could never go through with it for the reasons listed above. Okay, I was making her feel good. It was fairly certain that I had won this round, so a draw was in the works, and now I was hoping to make it 2-0 with me winning for a change. Kelly looked at the forms as if they were preparing to attack her. Do you still wish to initiate this cortisol? You read it correctly. Does it appear that I want to send you to the poor? Kelly chewed her lower lip. So yes and no. I have to admit that it's harder on you than it is for me. I may leave the marriage with only the clothes on my back, but you are going to pay me alimony for the next ten years. Why did you put that in? Funny, but that's the exact same question I asked Leonard when we were creating this cortisol chart. He said it would help her accept the changes. Is your skirt clean? I nodded. That's correct. Then you don't have any problems, do you? I assumed he didn't mean to smooth the way. As I'm sure you'll agree, I was the one who brought up the threesome nonsense, giving the impression that I was unhappy with the marriage. I am not. I enjoy being married to you, Kelly. I did this to demonstrate that I am not pressuring you into changing our prenuptial agreement. I am not being factious or confrontational. I truly believe that we need this to get through this difficult time, and that it will only strengthen our marriage. Okay, that was another half-truth, but I didn't have to be completely brainless. Kelly crumbled, which confused me greatly. I told you about the wine, so this wasn't completely unexpected, but I had expected her to argue more. Damn. Another of life's little mysteries to add to the vault for understanding how a female mind works. Okay, James, if this is what you need to make things right, I'll go with it. But let me say something. I do not need it. And God forbid, if we end up divorcing with you as the catalyst, I'll throw this prenuptial agreement away. I think it's unsavory, to say the least. I gave Kelly a sad, knowing smile. It may not appear so, but I agree with you on that score. I continued before Kelly could mount another defense. I'm afraid that life contains many necessary evils. Can you come to our attorney's office tomorrow at 11.30 a.m. so that he can witness the document and not raise it? Kelly went into the kitchen to prepare dinner, while I quietly examined the most recent calls made from our home phone. As I expected, the last four were to her friends, and she must have been complaining or seeking advice. In any case, I had no illusions about what Kelly would do if I cheated in our marriage, while I loved my wife unconditionally. I also knew how she treated anyone who crossed her. If it came to that, the prenuptial agreement would undoubtedly be part of the divorce proceedings. We met five minutes before the half hour, and Kelly fired one final salvo in the battle for supremacy. I hope this does not take long, James. I've got a lot of shopping to do before the day is over. I despised this tug of war, this struggle to see who was stronger. I always considered Kelly to be my equal in our marriage. All of this left a sour taste in my mouth. I couldn't understand why she didn't realize that communication and compromise were the keys to a successful marriage. Not this power struggle, which she appeared to be enjoying. My brow rose and I inquired. All of this has left me depressed, and I need some retail therapy to help me get through it. I have a $15,000 visa card that I intend to use to pay for that therapy, and I may even max it out. So be ready when the bill arrives from the bank, and do not say I didn't warn you. She ended with a cheeky, defiant smile. Okay, this is a draw as well. An expensive draw, but a draw nonetheless. I knew I wasn't going to win this, but $15,000 seemed a little excessive. What is it about women and plastics? If it is not plastic fingernails, then it is plastic surgery. Then comes the plastic tits, and everything is slapped onto their plastic cards. Kelly's words made me pale, but I nodded nonetheless. All for the betterment of our marriage, my dear. I sighed unenthusiastically, the old joke about wives, condoms, and wallets ringing in my head. 
For several months, I kept a close eye on Kelly and her involvement with what I had now dubbed the felonious. I noticed that while she never ended her fellowship with him, she took a significant step back. I even started to relax by conversing with them on a casual basis. I mean, very loose thinking. We had finally gotten over this hump in our marriage. We saw them at parties, but they mostly kept to themselves. And while Kelly would occasionally come over and chat, she was never out of sight. Things at home improved dramatically, with our love life going from so-so to really quite good, if not terrific. I'm winning big here. Why am I waiting for the other shoe to drop? Why are you looking at me like that? I understand the concept of supply and demand. Kelly could potentially be increasing supply in order to corner the market. Yes, the other shoe. She then reduces supply in the market. Crashes. Specifically me. I despise that concept. I hate being on guard. And I despise the fact that this was turning me into my father, the most cynical of them all. Leonard called me into his office two months later. Damn it, Leonard, you want to stop eating all that junk? How the hell are we going to get that midget throwing contest off the ground for the Christmas party? Not to mention you in case we end up throwing our backs out in the process. Leonard sat in his chair, staring at the young twerp standing in front of him. And no, I am not a mind reader. Do you think I'd have such a difficult relationship with my wife if I were? I know what he was thinking because he's called me that before for similar remarks, throwing his half-eaten jam donut into the box with the others, a shit-eating grin on his stupid dial. He mumbled about what was in his mouth. Everything must be going well at home, James. What makes you believe that? Leonard beamed a $1 million smile as he swallowed and cleared his throat. Because you're insulting my vertically challenged status again. I keep telling you that you have a long streak of pelican shit. I am not a midget. I missed that distinction by two points. Stupid inches, he said, attempting to lick a dab of jam from the corner of his mouth. For your information, I am 410 pounds in my loafers. He ended with a nonchalant shrug. I burst out laughing. Oh, boss, maybe it's my 6'4", but you appear shorter than that. Are they the platformers? You get to go on safari for four glorious days and three lonely nights. Leonard chuckled. What? Egad! Damn my big mouth. Where? Caxton Jackson Enterprises is looking for a new solvent that is greeny approved. And your small project fits the bill. I believe it may require minor modifications to meet their requirements, but that is your department's responsibility. It's your baby, and I expect you to put it to bed safely. God damn, Caxton. That's the end of nowhere. I retract everything I have ever said about you, Leonard. You're in a hole. How long did you say I needed to be there for? And when am I leaving? I know I'm in a hole, James. It's why we get along so well despite all of life's difficulties. Where in the hell would we be without them? For days I could see through it. You leave tomorrow. Just enough time to return home. Kiss the little woman on the forehead and pack a few bags before you leave. If we can pull it off, this business could turn a nice profit. Listen, Leonard, I know you are a good businessman who runs a tight ship, but I am an engineer, not a stupid salesman. Why do I have to leave? Leonard mocked me. I know you're my a-hole, Engineer James, but my stupid salesman Jeffers has already delivered the sales pitch. Now you'll clear up any doubts or misconceptions they may have and ensure that what we're offering meets their needs. Are you satisfied now? I grumbled. Yes, I have the picture. Caxton, make it happen ASAP. I got you. The damn idiot did not have to say anything good. Now get out of here. Particularly with that damn smirk on his face. I have a feeling my winning streak is about to come to an abrupt end. Kelly wasn't very pleased with this trip. Not that this surprised me in the least. Why has it been so long, sweetheart? The majority of your trips last only one day or overnight. What will I do by myself for four nights? To begin with, darling, it is not four nights, but four days and three nights. Furthermore, it indicates a good promotion and salary increase rather than stock options this time. I need to do something to pay off that damn credit card for your therapy. But it will only happen if I do this correctly. You'll have to do the same as me. Enjoy your shopping finds and miss your loving spouse terribly until I return Saturday afternoon. Kelly Defiance jumped to the front. Do not go there, James. I told you what would happen, so you can only blame yourself for that one. You'd better not make this a habit, sweetie. As you are aware, I am not particularly good at keeping myself occupied at night. I do not think my credit card can handle another therapy session so soon. Kelly laughed at my horrified expression. 
I'm only kidding, sweetheart. I just hated it when you and I disagreed and didn't talk to each other. I'll try to remember to call every night. Caxton was exactly as I remembered it from years before, with little to do but put in the hours and get home as soon as possible. Work had been exhausting, and they had nearly asked for the impossible. Trying to explain to the top executives how my solvent breaks down molecular structure was difficult, especially since most didn't know the difference between H2O and O2. H2O2 is commonly known as the hydroperoxide radical, or, well, never mind. You'd be surprised at how many people mix those two bloody molecules. H2O is what comes out of your kitchen faucet, but I got the point across. They sorted out their needs and came through for Leonard. It was Friday night and I was relaxing in the Plains Hotel's restaurant bar. I just got off the phone with Kelly. She complained about missing me and I consoled her as much as I could over the phone. Kelly had asked where I was eating that evening and I mentioned that the only respectable place in town was where I was staying. The setting was old and it showed, but it was clean and elegant. The only place in town where you can eat without getting food poisoning. I was sitting at the bar, chatting with a sales representative. Okay, traveling salesman, say nothing. There aren't many engineers out in the field. Okay. Anyway, I was waiting for a table to become available. Just then, my latest companion slid off his stool beside me and I bid him good night. I was about to order another beer when a voice interrupted my interaction with the bartender. Is this seat taken? I turned to see a very pretty redhead in her mid to late twenties, standing to the side of me, inquiring about the now vacant stool. Holy cow! She was attractive. No, it is all yours. I responded with my most suave and sophisticated tone of voice. I noticed she was dressed nicely, albeit a little more upscale than the setting required. Come on, gentlemen. I may have been married, but I am not yet dead. Waiting for a table. I asked for no other reason than to pass the time. The woman smiled. Yes and no. In fact, I was outside waiting for my date. He was supposed to arrive here half an hour ago. I figured I'd come in and get a drink while I waited. However, I have a sinking feeling that I have been duped. I managed to catch the bartender's attention. Can I buy you a drink while you're waiting? That'd be lovely. Thank you. She turned to the bartender and requested a white wine. Then returned to me. My name is Sarah, by the way. Nice to meet you, Sarah. My name is James, not Jim or Jimmy. I ordered drinks and made small talk. She gave me the same look that everyone gives me when I give my little speech. Sarah, do you come here often? I asked more questions to keep her from asking the obvious question. Oh no, I have no idea why Bill chose to meet here, of all places. I travel a lot, and this is the worst place to be stuck for the night. My date is someone I knew from school, and when he found out I was going to be in town for the day, he convinced me to join him for dinner. You cannot rely on anyone these days. I sympathize. Are you from here, James? Sarah asked as she sipped her wine. We only just met, and you're already insulting me? I chuckled. Damn backside of the world if you ask me. No, unlike you in business. And I'll be glad to be out of here tomorrow afternoon. One of the waitstaff approached me and informed me that a table had become available. I looked at Sarah and immediately thought, why the hell not? Again, that damn Newcastle song comes to mind. Do you remember that one? Google it, for goodness sake. Would you do me the honor of joining me for dinner? Since your date did not show up? You'd be doing me a favor because I hate eating alone. I don't know how long you'll have to wait for another table. I could see some hesitation on her face before she relaxed. Oh, what the hell? He can go jump into the lake. If he cannot be on time, he is not worth the effort. Thank you. James, I would be delighted. Dinner was pleasant. At the very least, I had company. We talked about our interests, both professional and recreational. I was a little concerned when Sarah started getting personal, but I was able to avoid any awkward questions. We had just finished dessert when I realized Sarah had overstepped the mark. She made it clear that she wanted to continue the night, possibly dancing or somewhere more private. I raised my left hand, twirled the ring around it, and smiled. Not to embarrass you, Sarah, but I am a happily married man. However, thank you for boosting my ego. You are a stunning woman and I appreciate your interest, but I'm a one-woman man. Sarah's face turned red. Oh, I apologize for being so forward. Please accept my apologies. It's just that I've been traveling for so long that finding someone to accompany me is difficult. 
It's difficult for me to express this without embarrassing myself in order to relieve my stress. And I found you attractive, intelligent, and amusing. You are definitely a breath of fresh air around here. I did not notice the ring. Please forgive me. You must be deeply in love with your wife. The thought that she was tripping over herself trying to apologize struck me as amusing. Yes, Sarah. I do. Furthermore, her claim that she hadn't seen my wedding band made me pause, as I had noticed she wasn't wearing one, but I accepted her apology regardless. Do not beat yourself up about it. I have enjoyed your company. I'm happy to be at least a consolation dinner companion in place of your missed dinner date. Your company has been both intellectually stimulating and humorous. As I previously stated, I dislike eating alone and would have preferred to have someone like you for all the other boring meals I've had to sit through. Kelly greeted me at the door wearing a black lace negligee. Stay awake. When I arrived home, I was wearing only stockings and high heels. They claim that women dress to impress. Okay, let me tell you, the less they dress, the more impressed I am. Okay, she wasn't wearing only heels or kneeling with a beer in hand, but it was close enough that I couldn't complain about the difference. I have a sneaking suspicion that I'm still on the clock, I replied with a huge grin on my face. Damn right, lover, you have some work ahead of you to make up for the three lonely nights I had to endure. You'll be fortunate if I don't screw you to death. Oh, well, at least she was at the door offering something. I grinned. So wouldn't you? We're making headway here, right? Now, sweetheart, this is the kind of overtime I could enjoy. Lead the way and I will follow you to the end of the earth. Kelly grabbed my tie. Bugger, the end of the earth, that is way too far. The bedroom will do just fine. Kelly then proceeded to have sex with me, sending me into oblivion. I waltzed into Leonard's office, feeling ecstatic about morning shorty. Who is the man? Leonard looked at me for a moment, and I wondered what his problem was. I gather you believe you are the man, but I only see a giraffe on steroids. I assume the trip went well. It could not have been better. I need to return in a few weeks to finalize storage and handling, as well as go over there and controls. But aside from that, it was a success. Stanton Chemicals is now expecting a good share dividend this quarter. I'd also like to thank you for your help with my domestic issue. Things have never been better. Leonard paused, which appeared unusual, but then smiled and waved his hand dismissively. It's much easier to see clearly when you're not wearing rose-colored glasses. Leonard seemed to want to say more, but he didn't. I suppose two failed marriages do that to a man. I'll make sure you have a little extra in your pay packet starting this week. Good job, son. Much appreciated. The weeks passed quickly, and life at home returned to normal after the trouble began. I was about to make my second trip to Caxton, and I was worried about what Kelly would say about my absence again. It should only be for one night, but if things don't go as planned, I may have to stay a bit longer. But you can count on me getting home as soon as possible. I was surprised by her response, though. Kelly smiled. I understand, sweetheart. We survived your previous trip. Her eyes showed a mischievous glint. Barely. As a result, this trip will be fine as long as you remember to take your vitamins in case you have to barf in the bedroom again. I know you are providing us with a comfortable lifestyle, which I appreciate, sweetie. I laughed. I see that I'll have to ask Leonard for the entire week off this time. This trip was not any better than the last. In fact, I increased my workload so that I could leave this godforsaken place a day earlier if possible. Long hours and even tighter schedules than they had anticipated made for an exhausting journey. My phone call home tonight will be my only source of relief once again. I was sitting at my table pondering the menu like a fish out of water when the waitress interrupted my concentration. Excuse me, Mr. Barrymore. Would you like some company at dinner? There's a lady at the bar who is alone, and I assumed the waitress had stopped talking because my attention was drawn to the woman she was referring to. Or so I assumed she was referring to. If she was the one I was swooning over. I quickly scanned the restaurant and knew she had to be there. She was the only unaccompanied female in the room, and she was damn attractive. Please send her over. Eating alone is not enjoyable at all. The waitress made the introductions. Mr. Barrymore, this is Miss Stevens. The waitress assisted her with her chair. Would you like me to get you a menu, Miss Stevens? The woman nodded to the waitress and extended her hand. The first name is Michelle. Mickey is only a nickname for me among my friends. I'm delighted to meet you, Mr. Barrymore. I hope this isn't an interruption to your evening meal. 
As I rose to greet my dinner guest, I nearly knocked over my chair. No, I am more than happy to converse with my dinner. My name is James. Please sit. I was so engrossed that I forgot my little spiel about being James, not Jim. Have you ever met your dream girl? So I can now say that I have. This woman was as perfect as if she had been handpicked from a Cadillac. Tall and slender with long, blonde, silky hair and only a good handful. Well, I am sure you get the idea. I was tempted to check that my tongue wasn't lying limp on the table. God, she was a female, perfection incarnate. Plates arrived as the beer and wine levels dropped. The conversation was pleasant, if a little stilted due to my lack of brain power. Do not look at me like that. Looking at Michelle was like seeing the perfect molecule in its full glory. Two of my IQ. Three points were required for eating, leaving three to think about. You're correct. The other one, 20, was conspicuous by their absence, most likely inspecting the chest of the vision sitting in the chair opposite. By this point, Norman had most likely been stuffed, reduced to a slobbering idiot. And that is not a condemnation of Norman. But you can see what? I'm getting it now. As it turned out, I was pleased that those three were working hard and doing their jobs, and that is keeping me out of trouble while also doing the thinking. But there was something that didn't make sense to me. Once I got over my initial excitement at meeting this Aphrodite impersonator. Sorry, I get very formal when I'm serious, and it must have gotten my attention. Michelle paused between bites, holding a fork full of food gracefully in slender, manicured fingers halfway to her mouth. What's on your mind, James? I set down my knife and fork and wiped my mouth on a napkin before placing it next to the plate, all the while attempting to condense all of my thoughts into a single coherent theory. What was it, though? The two points were awarded for not eating. Helping with that task allows me to huddle with the other three and do some brainstorming. Okay, perhaps it wasn't storming. Probably more of a slight precipitation, but I had nearly doubled my IQ. Michelle calls me James rather than Jim, as most people do, and she clearly does not mind having her name shortened. I decided to ask. I am perplexed by my recent good fortune, see? What have I told you? Formal. Michelle put her fork down and took a sip of wine. Perplexed. I am not sure what you mean, James. There she goes again. James. Not Jim or Jimmy. Suddenly, alarm bells rang, red flags appeared all over the place, and the 120 obstinate points realized that something was brewing and that they needed to get their butts back to work. I was conditioned to not use my full name. This simply stood out like dog balls. I took the time to look around the restaurant, and with all of my IQ points focused on one project, I was able to regroup and mount a strong defense. My formality grew stronger as I kept my voice low and modulated. I was here a few weeks ago and had the opportunity to meet and dine with another stunning woman. Now I'm sitting with absolutely gorgeous company, wondering what I've done to make the gods of fate smile upon me again. James, you appear to be suspicious. Michelle lowered her wine glass and tilted her head in inquiry. Now, I may be paranoid, but that doesn't mean someone isn't out to kill me. For the first time in my life, I wish the person I'm talking to would simply call me Jim. I was feeling extremely uneasy. My sister just had a baby and is still in the hospital. I'm here to visit her and decided I didn't want to cook for myself, so I came down to the only place in town where you could eat. I'm hoping to find food and friendship. Is there something sinister about that? I smiled, not in the least. Michelle, it's just who you are. Please forgive me for being so forward. You are my idea of perfection. You appear to be six foot or so. Your legs reach all the way to you. Excuse the terminology, but go all the way to your eyeballs and those gorgeous crystal blue eyes. The most likes I've ever seen. They almost glow from within. Blonde hair down to the waist. It flows like silk. And don't get too personal. However, your other feminine qualities are equally admirable. And that dress fits you so well, it almost appears to be painted on. Michelle had the good grace to blush at my depiction of her physical features. Why, James? Are you trying to seduce me? She batted her eyelids coyly. Thank you for your kind words, but only for a start. I'm just shy of 511. I try not to let my vanity rule me, but like most women, I enjoy feeling desired. She ate another bite from her plate. I sat waiting for Michelle to finish. I'm reminded of Caroline's attempted seduction. I now saw them as pathetic in comparison to Michelle. She seemed to want to add to your flattery. What exactly are we waiting for? I almost laughed out loud but kept it to myself. 
I now realize Michelle's entire wardrobe was designed with this specific goal in mind. Her hand movements were far more subtle than Caroline's. This woman knew her stuff. I apologize if you got the impression that everything I said was a seduction on my part. You are entitled to a certain amount of vanity. That is not why I am interested in your motivations. I nodded over Michelle's shoulder. There is one man at a corner table who appears to be more interested in us than the others, which, by the way, I understand because their obvious jealousy tickles my ego to no end. I know I'll have to go on a strict diet after our evening just to function without appearing arrogant. That man over there looks familiar, but I can't place him. Michelle was obviously aware of the effect she had on the opposite sex, as evidenced by her smile, but she also appeared antsy about the tone I was setting for the conversation. So I have to look around in amazement. There are four unoccupied tables. But I understand your desire for company, so that explains it. You appear to be no older than 25, while I am 10 years your senior. Taking in all the males in the room, I see at least two who are your age, better looking and dressed as well, if not better than I. Michelle corrected me again. I turn 30 next month, but thank you for the compliment. She was clearly trying to break my concentration. I nodded in recognition and continued. I don't mean to offend you, Michelle, but I believe there is more to this dinner than I'm being told about. Do you remember the equally beautiful woman I mentioned earlier? Although I must admit that I'm not quite in your league, it's only because I prefer tall, blonde women. She made it clear that if I were interested, the night could be over. Let's say on a more romantic note. Now I have flesh and blood. Venus de Milo is sitting right in front of me, almost offering the same scenario. Can you explain that to me satisfactorily? Michelle took another large sip of wine and looked away briefly. Mr. Barrymore, you appear to have a very negative attitude toward your attraction to the opposite sex. I noticed the formality and the change in names. She was backing off, but why? I could not understand. I can assure you that you are head and shoulders above the others in this restaurant. In that respect. Michelle was still trying to be professional. I was certain of that. I suddenly had a terrifying thought. Professional? Certainly not. That would ruin my entire night if I found out she was just drumming up business. I hope she's not playing the game. But this only left me with a more terrifying thought, and this one saddened me even more. I decided to call her bluff and sighed. Oh dear, you are good, but not quite good enough. That is not a reflection on your abilities, I will tell you why. To begin with. My dad has a saying. There are enough people in the world willing to deceive you. You don't need to add to their deception by tricking yourself. Michelle just sat there, listening. While I am aware that I have flaws, most of which I would rather not admit, I have no illusions about my physical attractiveness to the opposite sex, and there are at least a few men in this room who outperform me, hands down. I went ahead and told Michelle about the last few months with my wife. Michelle's eyes squinted and concentrated before hardening in recognition as she learned of the prenuptial agreement and the type of friends my wife was socializing with. So you're saying you think your wife is trying to set you up? In a nutshell, my dear, without that, I would have had no idea what you were up to. I am correct. This evening is about more than just good food and company. Michelle stared at her, her hands clutched tightly in her lap. Mr. Barrymore, your suspicions are not unfounded. When I should have been beaming with pride at my Sherlock Holmes deduction skills, instead what she just said caused my face to drop. It appears that the time has come to clear the air, so to speak. I work for an agency that deals with cheating spouses. We baited the trap and waited for the cheater to take it. She probably saw my face cloud up with annoyance. Before you judge me as a hooker, I assure you that I have not and will never bed any of the men I am paid to seduce. The man over in the corner is my minder. He's here in case you the mark gets, let's say, a little upset at being in that setup. I believe she threw that in. In case I was thinking of getting stroppy, I nodded my understanding, surprised at myself that I was relieved that this creature of beauty wasn't a common hooker after all. Now I remember where I saw him last. It was here, and I was in a conversation with him when he gave up his stool. When a woman. What was her name? I clicked my fingers, attempting to remember. Sarah? Yes, Sarah, if I remember correctly. Michelle acknowledged her arrival with a nod. Yes, Mr. Barrymore, her name is Sarah, and we work in pairs. 
It's safer and easier to shepherd the mark than to spend time chasing him down on our own. Your wife contacted our agency, concerned that you were having affairs while out of town on business. She gave us your picture and location, the rest was up to us. This time she shared your preference for tall, blonde women, hence why I'm here. It appears that we have both been set up. I grunted my agreement. So that explains why you never shorten my name as most people do. Sarah knew I preferred James, am I correct? Michelle smiled sheepishly and nodded. My mood had shifted from jovial to sad to angry in minutes, but I was able to keep it out of my voice. It perplexes and pains me that a woman like you would take on such an unpleasant job. Why are you in such a shady business? Michelle turned aside. You've just finished bestowing my physical qualities, and I don't want to appear any more Wagner than I am. You so graciously pointed out that I am almost there, damn near perfect. But I nodded knowingly. There's always a butt in there somewhere, right? You're right, James. All of this glamour, artificial tinsel and wrapping comes at a cost. This statement surprised me. There was more to the vision than what meets the eye. As appealing as that vision was, this woman understood what was real and important. It didn't prevent her from using her abilities. But don't we all? Kevin, my minder over there, is an excellent example of that price. You said it yourself. He outshines you in terms of physical appearance. And you're correct. He, like me, can have pretty much any woman he wants. Michelle dabbed the corner of her eye with a tissue. She was becoming upset. I wasn't sure why, but I gave her some time to settle. However, that handsome and rugged, good-looking exterior is accompanied by an ego and conceit that is equally ugly on the inside. Michelle paused as if in thought before continuing. He is the atypical embodiment of the adage, beauty is only skin deep, whereas ugly goes straight to the bone. He falls into the bad boy category, which, while sexy and desirable for one-night stands or casual relationships, is not a good trait to have in a perfect husband. In that regard, he pales in comparison to you. James, you easily defeated him. I watched Michelle try to control her emotions, a single tear rolling down her cheek which she quickly removed with a delicate dab of her tissue. Even with my beautiful appearance, I can't compete with that. Even I cannot keep their attention for long. This is where my sword's double edge cuts both ways. Michelle took some time to gather herself. Men like you who are far more attractive on the inside are extremely intimidated by my appearance. I've married two men as handsome as Kevin, including my most recent partner. So two marriages and one long-term relationship in ten years is not a great track record, James. They've all strayed because they believe they can, for whatever stupid reason. That is the primary reason I'm in this business. I despised infidelity. I sat there reflecting on Michelle's confession, feeling deeply for her plight. Michelle, I apologize for judging you unfairly. I have to admit to a certain amount of jealousy, and admitting to a flaw as such hurts me deeply. Michelle smiled sadly. What were you saying to Sarah? Do not beat yourself up about it. We all have crosses to bear. Mine may be a little easier than others. For what it's worth, I'm glad you remained true to your principles and did not succumb to my charms. It gives me hope that there could be a soulmate out there. Even for me. I am correct, aren't I? That you haven't fallen, and you were most likely never in doubt about it? I lowered my head and grinned. She almost got me. Michelle, I have to tell you that if I were to break my marriage vows, you would be the only woman who could possibly force me to do so. I'm sure every man on this green atom that we call Earth would say, I'm certifiable for not pursuing you with vengeance. But I have my principles, and I will not compromise them, even for you just so you don't feel slighted. If I hadn't figured out your intentions by the time dinner was over, I would have returned to my room and smashed my head against the brick wall, cursing my principles in the process. Finding out saved me from a severe headache. I chuckled. Michelle's chin was dripping with tears as she laughed at my final statement. Thank you, James. Thank you for renewing my faith in love and the sacredness of marriage. I am just sorry that it came at such a high cost for you. That statement struck me harder than expected. I had to admit that I wasn't really thinking about my marriage while talking to Michelle. It bothered me that, while I hadn't committed physical adultery, my mind had strayed. I decided to leave it for a while until I had more time to think about brightening the averted crisis.
Twenty-five of my IQ points returned to ogling this immaculate creature, while the rest were spent conversing with Michelle on a variety of topics. Ever the optimist, I took comfort in the fact that while this dinner had nearly destroyed my faith in my ever-loving wife, at least I'd had the opportunity to meet and converse with my dream girl, such as life. As our dinner came to an end, Michelle prepared to leave. I took her hand and lightly kissed her on the cheek. I will remember tonight for the rest of my life. Michelle, furthermore, if it helps, I believe your beauty extends beyond your skin. And if things had turned out differently, I'd have loved nothing more than to discover how deep yours goes. I know it sounds strange, but thank you for a wonderful evening. Michelle's face brightened as she stood and turned to leave before smiling back at me. You are aware of one of your qualities, James. I gave a quick shake of my head and shrugged. You have an incredible ability to make those around you feel very special. Sarah mentioned it to me before I met you, and I have to agree with her. Kevin doesn't have much of an advantage over you in terms of appearance, James, but when it comes to personality and character, he's not even in the same book, let alone on the same page. She winked and left, leaving me feeling both happy and sad. I returned to my room and closed the door. I had kept my anger under control throughout the evening, thanks in large part to Michelle's charm and poise. But now that I was alone, I let out my frustrations by picking up a glass and throwing it at the wall. That deceptive woman. I was angry at Kelly. I knew I needed to call home, but I wasn't sure I could keep it together. The last thing I wanted to do was give the game away. I knew I still didn't have any proof, but the smoke was thickening by the minute, and I needed more than what I had. If I was to prove Kelly's innocence or guilt in adultery, I needed to keep her in the dark, as much as she had kept me. I despise the mind games that stupid people engage in just to amuse themselves. Hello, sweetheart. How are you doing? To begin with, I didn't believe I could handle anything more. Kelly giggled, which irritated me and made me feel sick. How do you think I am doing? Will you be home as planned? I felt like reaching through the phone and grabbing her throat. Where did that come from? There could only be one reason why she assumed I wouldn't be home. Maybe she thinks I've hooked up with Michelle and plan to stay an extra day. I needed time to regain my composure, so I made it sound like it wouldn't be tomorrow, as I hoped. However, the next is scheduled for the following. I'll call you when I know more, but you can expect at least two more days. Can you handle it, sweetheart? As I spoke those words, I wanted to smash the phone to pieces. Kelly sounded pouty on the phone, but she accepted my apology. I suppose we can't do much about it. Just get home as soon as possible, baby. That was not the Kelly I knew. Things like this didn't just pass her by. She should be thoroughly soaked. She should have whined and complained. Her casual attitude toward extending my trip was uncharacteristic of her. I shuddered at Kelly's endearment, but managed to finish. I will, sweetheart. I miss you, my love. I'm exhausted from work, and all I want to do is go to bed. I'll get home as soon as I can. Now. That was the truth. I should be home by lunch if I finish my business here and take the first available flight out the next morning, given the flight time and commuting time. The following afternoon, I walked into Leonard's office and threw a pair of sunglasses on his desk. The man returned with good news. I hope Leonard left before he noticed the glasses. What are these for, James? he inquired as he picked them up at arm's length and held them against the window, looking through the lenses. I'm just letting you know that the rose-colored glasses are off. Leonard. I have a feeling you were more correct than I wanted to believe. Leonard's face turned sour and he dropped the glasses into the waste paper basket beside his desk. I thought you wouldn't be back for another day or so. You found out for sure. Then I shook my head. Not certain. But I have serious doubts about her fidelity. Enough to get one of your boys on her tail, at least. How did you know I would not be back so soon? Leonard leaned back in his chair and laced his fingers on top of his head. Okay, James, the fickle finger of fate has flipped you off. That is not in question here. What you have to ask yourself is whether you will lie down and accept it. Or do you just accept it and go on with your life? What are you planning to do? Leonard had not responded to my question, but he didn't always respond if he didn't think it was important. So I was confident I'd find out whether it was. For starters, I have to put up with it. Go home and pretend you know nothing. Kelly thinks I am a stupid, ignorant idiot, all while looking for an investigator to follow her movements. Damn, that is going to be hard. And I'm not sure if I can hold it together until I find out what she's been up to. 
I was never very good in drama class at school. The last thing I want to do right now is pretend I'm clueless and must follow. God knows who is in bed with her. Leonard sat forward, lowered his hands, and twiddled his thumbs, clearly agitated. I might be able to help you there, son. I just stared at him until he moved on. I took it upon myself to do some checking for you. I knew you were too involved and in love to set your sights on her, so I did it for you. I sat down heavily, my legs giving way even as I told Leonard about my suspicions. I was secretly hoping for a plausible explanation that I hadn't considered to explain everything that had happened, but Leonard's demeanor exuded finality. I had a sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach as I waited for Leonard to continue. I knew something wasn't right in paradise after your first visit. Leonard seemed reluctant to proceed, but I assured him that I appreciated his assistance. My son had your wife under surveillance while you were away. He didn't find any evidence of foul play. She did spend a significant amount of time next door, with many people coming and going. I wasn't sure what to make of it, so I did something that could potentially land me in serious trouble if it got out. I tapped your phone line and got all of the information. Leonard slid two cassettes across the desk for me. We still don't have any photos of her doing anything, but here are pictures of everyone who came and went while your wife was next door. Leonard spoke as he slid an envelope across the table. I opened it and looked at them. Do not worry about the phone. Tap. I will sign any necessary authorizations. This is my phone. I pay the damn bills and can tap it whenever I want. Looking at the photos, I said angrily, That's the four. All right. Every damn one of them. Plus a couple of singles I met on various occasions. Have you listened to the conversations? Is that why you thought I was coming home tomorrow or the next day? Leonard nodded his head. Yeah, I overheard your conversation with Kelly last night. She immediately called Carol and scheduled a party for tonight next door at Pam's place. If you weren't coming home, I was going to try to get some photographic evidence for you. I understand it was a long shot. My son stated that all of the blinds were tightly closed, so getting anything would be difficult. It is up to you, James. But if you don't want to wait, we can get them tonight, and you won't have to put up a front for her until you have visual proof. I sat in the chair and stared at my feet dejectedly. Leonard, you've made a huge mess. What a mess. What did I do wrong? Leonard picked up the Perspex box from his desk and played with it. I know, James, and you do not deserve it. Nobody does. Do not go flogging yourself, mate. From what I saw, the two of you treated her properly. There's no question about it. She just joined a bad crowd. You cannot be blamed for that either. She is not a child who requires a minder, James. She must take responsibility for her own actions. Do you want to listen to the tape by yourself? I do not know. You have already heard it. So it really doesn't make any difference, right? By the tone of my voice, your presence here may prevent me from destroying your office. Leonard recognized that both were statements, not questions, and did not bother responding. Listening to the taped conversation was one of the most difficult things I'd ever done. The frivolity and contempt, the obvious disrespect for me and our marriage, made me both angry and sick at the same time. It occurred to me at one point that I was partially responsible for her fall from grace. That was until her last phone conversation with Caroline. With each word Kelly said, I could feel my love for her fade even further into obscurity. It took a few days for me to get the tape installed on your first trip away, Leonard said, inserting a cassette into the player and bringing me back to the present. It is the Friday night before you return on Saturday. It doesn't prove anything unless you know what they're talking about, and it certainly isn't anything you can use in court. Leonard paused and asked again, Are you sure you want to hear this? I looked at him. Hell no. Leonard, I do not want to hear that. My wife is screwing the entire neighborhood, but that isn't my call right now, is it? Leonard, for all his stony expression, he appeared to be reflecting on his failed marriages once more. I apologize. Leonard, I shouldn't have ripped into you like that. Leonard's face was still stony, but there was a ripple of regret across it. That is okay, mate. I completely understand where your head is, what a difficult situation to deal with. As you know, I've been there twice, but I can't tell you. The second time around was just as difficult as the first. You're talking too much. Simply press the play button, you mongrel. I looked up and saw a sad smile on his face. Hello, Pam. Is everything prepared for tonight? It certainly is. What time will you be done? 
If he calls on time, it will be roughly the same as Wednesday night. My stomach tightened. She didn't even wait one night before going off. God knows who. I remember what she said that evening during my first trip. You have some work ahead of you to make up for the three lonely nights I had to endure. Yes, right. I don't think she was as lonely anymore. You're going to wear us out, girl. Just get those cards warmed up and ready. I'm feeling lucky tonight. We will do. Kel, we will be waiting. Leonard, press the eject button. Is that all we got for your first trip? I understand that it is not much. The rest is yours. And she called that night. Nothing for the next day either. It would have been helpful to have the wiretap in place before you left, but I didn't want to say anything to you until I knew for certain. As I previously stated, it appears she is going over for a game of cards. That is not necessarily infidelity material. If it hadn't been for the photos of all the players, I would not have continued with the tap. Leonard slipped the second tape inside. However, this one is a little more damaging. I quickly discovered that Leonard has a tendency to make devastating understatements. He pressed play, and there was some minor conversation about her mother and the charities Kelly was involved with. Then came our conversation last night. Then my world exploded in a mushroom cloud of smoke. Yeah, Carol. It's me. I just hung up the phone with Jack, Ash, and Jimmy. He is extending his trip. Are you certain? Isn't that unusual? You bet. I'm confident the blonde woman has finally got him. Don't put the cart before the horse, Kel. Think of Carol. He's in Caxton, for Christ's sake. The end of the world. You should have heard him go on about his first trip. There can only be one reason for his extended stay. And this is because he believes that he, and, like Flynn with that tarred-up hooker, he's probably not even nailed the woman yet. I know that from the inside out. He'll take it slowly so as not to scare her off. That is, if he gets anywhere with her. It does not matter to us. The intent will be present, and I will have him by the balls. It does sound promising, however. It is up to you, Kel. Damn right, men. What is that saying? They have two heads, but only enough blood to operate one at a time. I knew he couldn't help himself with that blonde woman. We chose from her description. She is his ideal fantasy girl. We were extremely lucky with that one. I believe I would like to celebrate. How about preparing an airtight sandwich for me? I do not know, Kel. You don't want to rush into anything, sweetie. We all agree that the last six months with you have been bloody fantastic. But we should keep it cool as we have been. The last thing we need is for old straight-laced Jimmy boy to realize you are playing him. I understand, Carol, but I'm horny as hell. I'm so excited about this. I could literally scream. I was ecstatic when he revealed his fantasy. It was a little lame, but I could definitely see potential.